I chose this picture because mm, uh, we have mentioned it earlier on. There is a text from a Yiddish moral book, and it says at the beginning there's a small text in Hebrew, and I, the Lord uh, founded earth with wisdom. And then it says this is this is Deutsch. This is Deutsch. Second book is the famous Zenerinne, the women's Bible, and it says in Belosian Ashkenaz. Here you see the two possibilities that you have heard of, and you also see it here in original text. Languages are not just an interchangeable means of communication. Moreover, they are much more. They are bearers of a culture, signs of belonging, even signs of the identity of their speakers. They are because every language has grown out of the native soil of a particular culture. This is also true for the Yiddish. I prefer to call it Jewish, German, as Yiddish authors do. They call Yiddish Teich, like here, or Yiddish Deutsch, or in geographical terms, Lotion Ashkenaz, the language of Ashkenaz. Lotion Ashkenaz is the Ashkenazic German, like Bavarian, the Bavarian German, Hessian, the German of Hesse, etc. Linguists uh, probably will not agree with me, but I'm a literary and religious researcher, and therefore these uh, linguist details are not so important for me. Literature is most important. Lotion, uh, Ashkenaz, and Deutsch. All these German languages that I mentioned are different, but they are all German languages. With my contribution, I want to show today that Yiddish is not only linguistically, according to its lexicon or uh, semantics, but that it is n not only according to its vocabulary, or semantics, and syntax, um, it is a uh, common n regional German culture. Yiddish has grown out of German culture like other German dialects. Therefore, the Jewish German culture is very different from the Oriental Jewish one. This is a very important marker. The Jewish literature coming from the Orient is quite different from the Jewish literature that was issued in Germany or that was created in Germany. And it is this German cultural heritage that the Yiddish-speaking Jews have uh, carried with them into their far-flung exile, or let's say to all ends of Ashkenaz and far beyond. You will see that I use the term uh, uh, Ashkenaz. It does not only cover Germany, but the whole area where the Lotion Ashkenaz was spoken. Let me show this uh, by hand of the Yiddish folk culture. We all know that our belonging to places and to human communities is emphatically expressed in storytelling. It is only when we have something to tell about a place or a human community, we truly belong to them because telling and hearing stories shapes ourselves. Because this is a fact, I will demonstrate what I have said with the help of Yiddish folk tales. These Yiddish stories belong to a literary genre that one likes to call the quintessential German cultural asset, namely the German fairy tales. The Yiddish folk tales contain all those legendary enchanted and strange motives that are celebrated as German world cultural heritage. These Yiddish stories contain all the fairy tale motives that give rise to the German magic fairy tale, demons and sorcerers, witches, uh, revenants and werewolves, the great forest in which one gets lost. This narrative heritage was not collected and put down on paper by the Grimm brothers until the 19th century. Much of it, however, and just its typical spirit, can be found centuries earlier 
in the Jewish German written monuments. That is the coat of arms of the city of Worms. Exemplary for this is uh, that these. Uh, well, let me give you the case of uh, Worms. Exemplary for this is. Uh, Worms' very own founding legend, which explains the name of the city and its coat of arms. Strangely enough, this central piece of Worms' identity has survived only in the uh, Jewish German legend book Maisim of the 17th century. This is the title page of the first uh, issue, and it was published in Amsterdam, a warm legend which was published in Amsterdam. The author of the storybook was the community servant of the warm Jewish community, Yuspa Shamis. In it, Yuspa Shamis tells the original legend of the founding of Worms about a lindworm that camped outside the city in the pre-Christian times and demanded that a citizen be eaten every day on condition that he would not destroy the city any further. This went on, this thread went on until a locksmith, and therefore you found there also the key, uh, made himself a suit of armor armed with knives and volunteered to be thrown to the dragon for food. Of course, the lindworm perished on this uh, razor-sharp food. And as uh, a reward for this rescue, the locksmith married the widowed queen and became the king of the town himself. Yuspa Shamis wrote over the story like this. Uh, the story of why the town is called Voimaisa and has a key on its coat of arms. Notabene, this founding legend of Rome is only found in this Jewish booklet, and this is uh, uh, astounding. However, this little booklet, uh, which uh, was uh, so important uh, uh, only after the expulsion of the Jews from Worms in 1696 in exile in Amsterdam. In the following, please always pay attention to the places of publication of the books to be mentioned. These are uh, scattered throughout Ashkenaz uh, for the same book in each case. Uh, so the same book was uh, published here and there, and this also makes you wonder. Not enough uh, that this uh, uh, book uh, was published in Amsterdam. This uh, founding legend uh, was even um, known and heard of uh, in Mohilov, uh, as far away as 70 kilometers of uh, Kiev, and received its pictorial representation in the synagogue there in 17. 40. With their German language, the Jews also carried the German Rhenish cultural heritage with them to the east. But the picture from the Mohileva synagogue says much more. And this extremely significant more can also be found in the booklet by Yuspa Shamis. Here you see this uh, highly built a city. At the top, you see the name in Yiddish, Varmaisa, and then you see the lindworm, and to the right, uh, the, the tree, that is Etzak Yachim, the, the tree of life, the uh, parrot physical tree of life. In a second story, Yuspa Shamis tells uh, that the warm Jews uh, uh, came to Worms after the destruction of the first Jerusalem temple in 587 before Christ. Um, that's a long time ago. And after the Babylonian exile was over, the Jews who had returned to Jerusalem wrote to the Worms Jews that they should now also return to Jerusalem. But the Worms Jews did not listen to their brothers in the Holy Land. Uh, instead, they wrote to them the following reply. Well, you in greater 
Jerusalem, and we will abide here in the Holy Congregation of Worms in Lesser Jerusalem. Only now you can understand the Mohilev image. This is uh, a picture by Elitsky, the art, the, the painter. Here you see the synagogue uh, to the left of the Torah shrine, while on the right side, the, the Palestinian Jerusalem is shown. And even more astonishing, in the picture of Worms, the small Jerusalem, the parasitical tree of life is depicted next to the Lindworm, while the great Jerusalem had to be content with the tree of knowledge. One could not express this more clearly in Ashkenaz. The little Jerusalem stands on the Rhine with the tree of life, and in Palestine, the other Jerusalem to which belongs the tree of knowledge. For the Jews in the very east, notabene, in the very east of Ashkenaz, for them the center of their homeland is on the Rhine. There is the tree of life in little Jerusalem. This story and the two stories and for the ones you find in my book, I just show it to you briefly. If you are interested in such stories, you find all them uh, uh, about the. Uh, I, uh, translated the Schumer uh, stories and commented on them. Certainly, it was no coincidence that the image of Ashkenazi Jerusalem is found in at least two Eastern European synagogues. It was precisely around this time, in the middle of the 18th century, that the powerful popular m movement of Hasidism rose there. And this Hasidism, in its founding legend, again explicitly traced itself back to two Rhenish cities, namely to Worms and to Bingen. In the 17th century, here, uh, I take this from the, uh, the book because you find here the German uh, text and the commentaries that I summarize here. In the 17th century, in Prague and later in Amsterdam, a small Yiddish booklet was published. Its title is My Yiddish Teitschmerisch does not sound very true, but I try my very best. So, and now he speaks uh, in this language. Well, a wonderful story of a Baal Shim, and he was called uh, from Bingen and uh, tells it about Bingen. A Baal Shem is a magician who performed miracles with holy names of God. The stories told in this booklet by, by Adam are original German his stories. Before this uh, Rabbi Adam, the same stories are told that were told in Christian homes of Dr. Johannes Faust and the Sponheim Abbot Johannes Trimitemius. The same narratives by Dr. Johannes Faust, Abbot Johannes Trimitemius, Rabbi Adam and Further, Worms Baal Shem and Hus Baal Shem, that are also shown by Yus Baal Shem. All those uh, were in circulation in the German-speaking world at the same time. Uh, Johannes Faust, Johannes Tretemius, Rabbi Adam, and others Baal Shem, the same stories were told. The Christian and Jewish narratives uh, and stories, despite their religious and ideological differences, they, uh, there is the legitimate use of holy names of God here and the devil's pact uh, there. They nevertheless, same, nevertheless a draw from the same sources. This commonality is evident in the narrative motives as well as in the plots. Even the places of action of these stories are to a certain extent the same. In the case of both the Christian and Jewish heroes, the miracles are performed on the one hand at the imperial and at princely courts, the other setting. In the Christian area are universities and uh, the yeshiva, the Jewish University is the same uh, 
locations, uh, but there is uh, just a small difference, uh, the Jewish religion uh, for the Jews and uh, the Christian universities. Uh, the players are the uh, Christian magicians or the by by Rabbi by Aisham. On both sides, the same stories are told. First, uh, the miracle man has his leg torn off and then glues it back uh, on with a flour paste without any problem. Second story, the miracle man makes heroes of ancient times appear before his uh, spectators at the festive banquet and everything uh, trembles and everything is great. But for the Christian magicians, it is Alexander the Great, the beautiful Helena, Achilles and Hector. For the U Jewish Balakishem, it is the biblical general of uh, King David named, named Job. It was also popular to conjure up a whole castle where the tables were laid with a rich banquet to which the miracle worker invited the emperor or the prince together with his court as guests. That is to say, the Jews had the same stories as the Christian magicians. The parallelism between the Jewish and Christian uh, narratives shows the unity of the two folk cultures despite the religious difference. Finally, it is surely no coincidence that the birth of Rabbi Adam is set in Bingen, namely in a region where the two most important Christian opponents, uh, Dr. Johannes Faust and the Sponheim Abbot Tritanius were active. So we have uh, before us a German Christian Jewish collection of literature dealing with the competition between Jewish and Christian magicians. Both bring about the same miracles, but both with dif by different means and methods. Here, these uh, stories are uh, based in uh, Rhein Nahe region. The Jews also carried these stories, which were nar native to the Rhein Nahe region, with them to the east. And this, in particularly significant context, which was especially formative for Eastern Jewry. From the founding legend, Chiffre Ar Basht, mm, we learn the most astonishing news that this very Bingen rabbi, the miracle maker Adam Baal Shem Tov, was the teacher of Israel Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Eastern European Hasidism. The Yiddish version of this legend says it explicitly. You can read it here, if you can. All the deeds of power and miracles that the Abesh performed uh, stemmed entirely from the writings that came to him from the Baal Shem Tov Rabbi Adam. That is to say, the East uh, Yiddish movement has its origin here, and it's said here. The Hasidic legend of uh, the Baal Shem Tov offers a whole cycle of such typical miracles, among which is that of the conjured banquet uh, for the emperor. This means the powerful uh, uh, East European religious folk uh, movement of Hasidism, which is still alive worldwide today, sees in the Rhenish Baal uh, Shem, the teacher of its own founder, Israel ben Elizir ben Shem Tov. The German Jewish folk culture was seen as the foundation of the Eastern European folk movement of Hasidism. It doesn't stop there. The legend of the Lubavitch Chabad Hasidim, and we know them all, they are very active in German again. It takes the Rhenish genealogy of Hasidism down even further. The sixth rabbi of the Lubavitch Habba Hasidim relates to that uh, and says that Rabbi Elia Loanza, the Baal Shem of Worms from the 16th and 17th century, who moved to Prague in 1624, is said to have founded a secret order of the so-called Nistarim, the hidden ones in Worms, which pursued the goal of spreading Kabbalah among the Jews. And Rabbi Elia Bar Shem of Worms had chosen Rabbi Joel, the Baal Shem 
of Samashti as his successor. And finally, Rabbi Joel chose as his successor our very own Rabbi Adam Bal Shem. This are Rabbi Adam, as the Shevir Hapech relayed, finally handed over to the office of chairman of the Nisrim to Israel Ben Azlis Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism. The sixth Lubavitch Rebbe thus sees Hasidism as the direct successor movement to the order of the Nisrim founded in Worms, which from the very beginning as the Hasidic movement still does today spread the Kabbalist Hasidic doctrine through a systematic network of emissaries. The inclusion of the Rabbi Adam stories in the founding legends of Eastern European Hasidism is a powerful testimony to the fact that the Jews, along with their German language, are also regarded German cultural heritage as a fundamental part of their identity. There is some evidence of this miracle man narrative tradition whose roots in the German culture even the worst uh, Jew hater will not be able to deny. They are handed ba down by the Johann Jakob Schutt, a profound connoisseur of Jewish Jewry in his Jewish Merkwürdigkeiten. Listen for yourself. Mr. Wilfred tells us that short time ago there lived in Worms a Rabbi Elias with the name Bala Shem, that is the conjurer of Kabbalists, of whom the Jews know many miracles to tell, among others, that he once made merry with some friends, since one of them let himself to be heard that he would like to have a drink from a certain wine merchant in cellars in Frankfurt and from a named barrel of his wine. Elias then hammered a stake into the wall. Then, as soon as the delicious wine, by the help of the divine names used by him, comes out as it from the hand. Another Arnoldus reports that a common Jew told him that he had once been at a dinner where he, there was a shortage of wine. And then some of the guests had spoken the Shem, the name of God, and stuck a knife into the wall. And then so much wine as they needed ran out from the barrel of a Jewish wine tavern. Because it has to be kosher. That's obvious. And that don't need to comment on that any further. This is original German cultural heritage, isn't it? Finally, I will mention the well-known Jewish story of Rabbi Amram. His body was taken from a boat that swam alone on up the Rhine against the current from Cologne to Mainz, so that he could be buried in the grave of his fathers in Mainz. This story is nothing other than a Jewish version of the Christian story of St. Emmerman, whose body had likewise swum against the current on a raft from Aschheim to Regensburg. Am I at the end already? This can't be true. My time is over already, isn't it? Oh my goodness. <laughs> So go ahead. So, so then let's jump a little part. I just wanted to show you that the most important uh, central books of uh, Jewish uh, literature at the same time um, were printed at different places, here in the west and uh, very far in the east, in Poland and even farther to the east. The same books in the same language were printed. Now let me finally, if you just give me another few minutes... So we would love to listen to you any further because, uh, anyway, there is one speaker who will not come today. So I wanted to say with the Yiddish books, which were printed at the same time in the East and in the West, that uh, describes also the commonalities in the language and in the culture. And we even have it on black and white. So in order to underpin the commonalities between uh, Jewish and Christian literature, I could have a very simple way to refer to the old uh, Jewish Spielmann's literature. There's the um, famous Bobo Buch, a, a German knight who plays there, who was uh, in the 19th century, or Dukus Horand, which is a version of Christian 
songs uh, around 1300s, Schulbuch in uh, 16th century describing the spirit of Nibelungen. All these Yiddish books are very much similar to German and um, one would then quickly object, of course, that this was only read in the West, that means in the German-speaking world. But here, too, the threats have not been severed, 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 as can be seen with modern Yiddish writers from Eastern Europe, who have uh, made sure to revive this old uh, heritage of literature. Another example for this uh, transfer of culture are the Perving Games, Those are the books which I have just uh, mentioned. Now let's uh, speak about Purim, the Jewish carnival, if you want to put it like that. Another example for West Eastern tradition uh, transfer of uh, traditions has served the literature of theater, namely the Purim play. For a long time, people have compared the burlesque theater play with the Christian carnival play, and they also have seen the parallels to Bible plays of the Christians. The relationship of the Purim play with Shroftide play can be seen first that both, in fact, uh, are both genres were still and are performed in a very similar way at the respective Christian or Jewish carnival, that is Purim in this case. The actors were often young boys, mostly Talmud students, who went from house to house to perform their short or longer play and therefore collected donations. The Purim play, like the Shroftide play, was also performed in the streets with or without music. The relationship is also evident in the dramaturgy. At the beginning, for example, the performance of the performance as scribe, a herald or runner appears who introduces the expected play and intervenes again and again with comments. There are live living pictures at the beginning where the heroes are introduced and brought into the presence of the audience. Of course, there is also a, the jester, the jokester, who is sometimes referred to in, uh, by the name pickle herring or hanswashed in Jewish. Very often the jester's interludes uh, interrupt the action without being really part of it. The jester's jokes know no inhibitions and either so on either side of the religious divide and often resort to the most vulgar and rivaled means. It goes even so far that the Biblos Mordechai appears as a jester in parodies of the biblical texts without any shame. Nor does the thematic design omit anything in common. There is this central theme, and now by, finally the women show up in my text, there is the central theme of relationships, indeed the struggles between husband and his wife, common to all his of the often vulgar eroticism and fecal language, the mockery and parody of all what is holy. Of course, again on both sides, the, both, uh, in the, the moralizers and pious guardians of morals soon steered the games into more demure channels. But let us hear an example from the Frank Frankfurt and Leipzig Purim play of 1714, which you would never, never ever believe that it came from a Jewish text. I will spare you the worst and bring only a few gentler lines. In the Frankfurt, uh, Pur Frankfurt Leipzig Purim spiel, the crier opens the play like this. And uh, now this is the most modest one. Click to, click to, be here or otherwise woo. Hither, hither, you gentlemen fashion. They will show in what's nigh, nigh and more. And Koenig was coming on here. A Koenig was coming on Iran. And all the world will not be the, sh the same. Koenig Achter Schweros, he is called. 127 land countries he has already under his hand. The land, the countries and roads he has to climb and conquer. Therefore, a uh, Jewish marshal has to say and sing. Drum euch and schmeiß die Stub zum Window raus. The play will the 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 so, so this is liter Yiddish literature and it was presented in Yiddish. As I said, I withhold the really vulgar jokes from you. Read them yourself.
Yes, we are all are really at the German Fastnachts and Bauernschwank. At somewhat higher level, the Purim play is virtually expanded into an opera with music and elaborate elevators and costumes. The Russian musicologist Moshe Berigovsky and his daughter Ida collected a large collection of operatic Purim plays in the 30s and 40s, which later were even performed again in Israel. The Potsdam inventory compiled by Eva Elvira Krötzinger offered at least 11 Purim plays from the period at the same area. This Western Yiddish theatr theatrical tradition thus led a powerful life in the East as well as in the West. A far more chaste prologue than one of the Frankfurt uh, is one is the Purim play taught by Ida Berigovskaya. Let me quote. As die Megille ist scheuen in Besmetrisch ganz verspreit und junge weiblich und junge meidlich weiß nicht, was, der, was in der Megille steigt. In der Megille steigt, weil ich hier bin mir Achaschwerosch, Achaschwerosch ist gewähnt, ein größer Mann über uns alle leiden. Stiller und stiller, meine Liebste leiden. Los Geduld sein und los gestillt sein auf ein kurze Zeiten. I cite this classic traditional prologue of a Purim play performed annually in the East in order to conclude my short speech, which still was too long, by showing that this living folk tradition, which came from Western Germany, was eventually carried on to the even higher level of modern Yiddish literature. It is this living tradition of Purim plays that the great Yiddish poet Itzik Manga of Czernowitz, he lived between um, 1901 and died in 1969, included in his wonderful Megillah songs. Manga, like still other modern Yiddish writers, has also revisited the Western traditions of the ancient Yiddish minstrel songs and epics. I mentioned about there was a reception of the older Yiddish tradition in modern Yiddish literature of the 19th century. And he continued this uh, tradition and uh, included it in his form of uh, Purims. So there is a participation of literature which the German Yiddish uh, language took to us. Euro Eastern Europe preserved it there and continued to cultivate it. As the end, the prologue of the Herald from the Mangas Megille songs shall do, that is the songs of the Billig Easter scroll. With these songs, which drew to the old tradition, Manga created a modern Purim play in which he also added newer modern themes to the old material. Here then, for example, he included a love scene and a revolution scene which was not original uh, in the plan. So free love which was not something normal in Eastern Europe and also the uprise against the king. So the prologue of Itzik Mangel of the Milgili songs is as follows and this will be in Yiddish. Wer's wird leinen, wird wie ein Biber weinen. Und wer's wird herren, wird lachen mit Tränen. Ott geien sei alle still, die Helden von der Megille. Ach, schwerosch der König, das viel er trinkt, ist ihm wenig. Esther hamalke die Grine und wasch die in der Krinoline. Mordche der Kuch im Attik und hamen der Rosche der Lattik. Herr Kitzer, alle Sachen euch zum Weinen und zum Lachen, werd ihr in einem Bichel gefinden, nehmt sei euch gut in Sinnen, und ob ich euch sag liegen, Herz und Werts anschwiegen. Ich danke. Thank you very much.